Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Welcome to our Acts 17 podcast on our study of the Key Chapters of the Bible. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. We've got a lot to get to in today's episode, so let's jump right into Acts 17. So here we come to Acts 17, which contains Paul's famous sermon on Mars Hill. Now, this is a great sermon that just gives us great principles of evangelism. But before we get to his sermon, Luke first tells us about two important stops along the way in the cities of Thessalonica and Berea. So let's go to verse 1 of Acts 17. Verse 1 fast forwards through the cities of Amphipolis and Apollonia, and then brings us to the ministry work that Paul does in Thessalonica. Thessalonica is tucked back into the northern part of the Aegean Sea, a little bit to the east of Greece. Now, this was a major city at the time. Amazingly, 200,000 people were in this city. It was a commercial hub for this region. And so not surprisingly, Thessalonica has a synagogue. And so verse 2 tells us that Paul spent several Sabbaths, as in several weeks, in that synagogue, teaching them about Jesus Christ. Now, we see from verse 3 that much of this teaching was centered on the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Why? Well, we could probably surmise that the people had questions, natural questions that a Jewish person might ask. Like, uh, you know, Paul, if Jesus is this messianic king you said he is, then why would he have to suffer such a gruesome death? Now, we know the answers from our podcast in the past are spelled out in Isaiah 53, Hosea 13, Psalm 16. And Paul was probably citing these prophecies or other ones, just showing how they were all fulfilled in Christ. And that's why Paul could confidently say at the end of verse 3, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And so in verse 4, plenty of people were persuaded by Paul. But verse 5 tells us, that just as we have seen in these other cities, there are also Jewish folks who hated this message, and they form a mob against Paul and his compatriots, and they grab Jason and bring him to the city authorities and, and declare that he's part of the problem because he's welcomed these guys. Now, who is Jason? Well, interestingly, Luke doesn't tell us much about Jason, and and we kind of have to just kind of read between the lines here and and just gather that they were staying at his house. And and so he's letting them stay with him for these few weeks. This is kind of just old-fashioned Jewish hospitality here. And probably once the church was actually started in Thessalonica, he must have been so well known to the church at that time that really no further explanation about who he was is even necessary. It's kind of like when we just refer to George Washington. When we refer to George Washington, we don't normally say George Washington, first president of the United States, born in 1732, and then go on to talk about him. We just refer to him as Washington or George Washington. And that seems to be what's going on here in Acts 17. Well, we see here in verse 9 that Jason puts forward a pledge, which probably was a fine where he would have to pay this pledge, and if they caused any more trouble, he'd lose it. And so that was just a way of involving him and keeping things under control here. And so with all this going on here, it's pretty clear it's time for these apostles to move on. And so they move on to Berea in verse 10. Verse 11 describes these Bereans with this classic, well-known statement, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And so they, these guys were just students of the word of God. They heard what Paul to say and they want to make sure it squares with scripture. And the amazing thing is when these people actually compared Paul's message to the prophecies of the Old Testament, they found that what Paul was saying was true. The prophecies did speak of the coming Messiah King. They did foretell of him being cut off and, and killed this bloody atoning death and, and that he would rise and just be exalted. And so verse 12 tells us that a number of them believed. And the them there is referring to the Jewish believers from the synagogue. They were believing Paul's words. And verse 12 then also says many prominent Greeks from Berea also were coming to faith in Christ. And so the gospel is coming to Berea and just lives are being changed. Now, not surprisingly, folks in Thessalonica get wind of this. They don't like what's going on over in Berea. And so they come over and they stir up the crowds. And soon Paul was ushered out of Berea and brought into Athens. Now, while Paul was in Athens, Silas and Timothy were buttoning things up back in Berea, and so Paul was in Athens alone. And yet the Lord uses this event here to accomplish his next phase in his work in Europe. So let's just picture this world that Paul has walked into. Up till now, Paul has seen all kinds of different cities. He's probably gone through postage stamp villages that weren't even recorded. He's gone through larger cities like Philippi, massive cities like Thessalonica, but here he's entered a city of about 20,000 people. It's not the largest city in the world by any stretch. Corinth and Thessalonica and Jerusalem were all far larger. But what Athens lacked in population, it made up for in reputation. 
Athens was an intellectual, philosophical powerhouse of the Greek-speaking world. About 500 years earlier, it had become a complete democracy. At that time, its citizens just produced one of the greatest periods of artistic development in the history of mankind. They built magnificent public buildings. It was commonly praised for its beauty and its grandeur. It attracted intellectuals from all over Greece, and it was the leading edge of study in philosophy and rhetoric and science. And then about 100 years before Paul arrived, a bit more than that, the Romans came in and they overtook Athens. They looted it of much of its art. They allowed the university to stay. And so it was still the place where your major thinkers would come and, and just discourse. And so you had uh, major speakers there like Socrates and Plato, Epicurus, and, and many more. Obviously not while Paul was there, but that was just part of Athens' history. And so you've got all of this intellectual philosophy as the background. And then here in verse 15, a messenger with the most life-changing truth Athens will ever hear has just come to town. So let's go on to verse 16. In verse 16, Paul is waiting for Silas and Timothy, and he just kind of looks around and he sees all these altars dedicated to all kinds of false gods. Verse 16 says, his spirit was being provoked, which is just this idea of deep emotional concern. He sees these altars, but they have no truth. He sees these false gods, but nothing to the true God. And so, as was Paul's custom, he started his evangelistic work in the synagogue. And so, in verse 17, he's in the synagogue reasoning with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and no doubt saying much of the same thing he's been saying all along in all these other synagogues. And now, verse 17 also tells us that their conversation spilled out into the marketplace, and Paul was there every day reasoning with whoever happened to be there. And so in verse 18, Paul's out there in this marketplace reasoning with whoever will come along and, and who comes along but some Epicureans and some Stoic philosophers. Uh, they begin to talk with Paul. The word converse in the NAS of verse 18 is the Greek word sunabalo, which is this idea of considering and pondering and disputing and discussing and debating. It's just a, a really rich word here. And I would imagine that many of us have had similar extended conversations with people who completely disagree with us, but who are up for the discussion. And so they're talking with Paul, and in verse 18, some people are calling him a babbler, and, and that's a pretty pejorative term. It's a term for a scavenger. It was literally one who picks up seeds, and it's referred to like a bird just kind of going around picking up seeds, but it came to be applied to a person who's just an information scavenger, just kind of cobbling together a bunch of ideas, but having nothing worthwhile to say. And so obviously not a very high view of Paul, and, and, and yet in all of this, some people were hearing what he was saying and recognizing he's talking about the deity of Christ, but they couldn't wrap their mind around what he was saying. And so they decide to bring him to the Areopagus so he can give a formal explanation of his message. Now, the Areopagus is what we call Mars Hill. It's a relatively low hill that was just naturally formed out of limestone, and they would just stand on this limestone hill and, and hold court, all kinds of things, oftentimes even like legal proceedings. And so they bring Paul to the Areopagus, and they let him unfold his message. And now we come to Paul's famous speech on Areopagus, again, also known as Mars Hill. We could literally spend several full-length sermons just unpacking Paul's words here. So my little few-minute overview won't do it justice. We're not going to read it line by line, but I'm going to focus on the main points that Paul makes to these Greeks, which will in turn, if we just kind of gather the principles from here, we'll see that it helps us frame conversations when we're talking with non-believers about Jesus. And so as we go through this passage, we need to keep in mind one of the overarching principles we need to see here in this passage is that evangelism is discipleship. Paul is teaching these people, and the message that Paul is laying out is rich with truth and theology about God and, and mankind's condition before him and our need for our Savior. This is not a Hallmark card filled with warm, fuzzy fluff. This is hard-boiled truth about God. These are the things we need to know to be reconciled to him. So let's unpack this message, starting in verse 22. In verse 22, Paul begins by talking about seeing all of their altars, even an altar to the unknown God. And he is now declaring, so he has come to proclaim to them the truth about who this God is, the one they don't know. And so the first thing we see in this evangelistic sermon is we need to teach people about God. That's what Paul is doing here. For instance, in verse 24, Paul teaches that God is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not dwell in temples made by mankind. In verse 25, Paul teaches that God is not served by human hands, and he gives life and breath to all people, as in all of you guys who are listening. In verse 27, he teaches that God created us to know him and that he is not far from any of us. And in verse 29, he teaches that God is not made from gold or silver or stone. 
Now, I would imagine these Athenians were probably insulted by this lengthy discussion about God. I mean, after all, who knew more about God than they did? Paul, just look around. We've got countless idols, countless temples. We've got it all figured out. Yeah, well, they didn't have the truth. And despite all their idols, they still needed to know about the true God. You see, people have all kinds of views about God. It's been said that every person's a theologian. The question is, are they a good theologian? And so Paul is trying to teach these people good theology about God. And so he starts with the fact that God exists, and then he goes into how we are accountable to him. Going back to verse 25, he says that God gives life to all people and breath to all things. In verse 26, he has determined our appointed times and the boundaries of our habitation. In verse 27, he's not far from each one of us. And finally, in verse 28, in him we live and move and exist. Now, there's an entire textbook of theology in these verses, but it all boils down to this, that people need to know that they have a creator and that their creator is personal and powerful and he's not far from us. And whether or not they realize it, every moment of their lives depends upon God. He carries them. He gives them life. He sustains them with breath. In him, we live and move and exist. And without his grace and without his sustaining power and work in our life, we would all be gone in an instant. And so we need to teach people that since God sustains them, he therefore has a legitimate claim on their lives. They are beholden to him. They are accountable to him. They are obligated to him, to honor him, to obey him, and to serve him and to worship him. And so then with all of that, just moving on in Paul's message here, we also need to teach them about their condition before God. This is found in verses 30 and 31. Starting in verse 30, Paul says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness. And so people need to know their condition before God, that a day is coming for each of us when we will give an account for our lives and a holy and righteous God will examine our lives. Now, just about everybody thinks they're a good person. So when we tell people the gospel and we tell them about God, we need to show them that they have violated God's standards and thus we're not going to fare well in his judgment. We see this in verse 30. Verse 30 tells us there is coming a day of judgment. You see, God cannot have any sin in his presence. And if we were to enter his presence with our sin, where do we go if we can't be in his presence? Well, Revelation 20 tells us, verses 14 and 15 says, Then death and Hades were thrown to the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown to the lake of fire. And so that's a person's condition before this holy God. We are accountable to him. And if our sins are not cleansed, we too will be thrown to the lake of fire. And so having established our accountability before God, Paul then takes them to Jesus. When we proclaim the gospel, we must proclaim that Jesus is their only savior. In verse 31, Paul told them that Jesus has been appointed as the judge of mankind. And God has proven this at the end of verse 31 by raising him from the dead. So this is key. The resurrection is key to this message. The resurrection points to the work of Christ. And and whenever Paul explains the gospel in detail, he always speaks of the resurrection. In the book of Acts, there are 12 major sermons given by various preachers, and every one of them, the resurrection is prominently mentioned. The resurrection is the capstone of Christ's work on the cross. The resurrection is the culmination of everything that Jesus did, is the triumph over the last enemy of death. It points to Christ as the conquering son of God, the author of life, the the full atonement for our sins accepted by God and raised for all the world to see. The resurrection is the offer of hope that just as Jesus Christ has eternal life in himself as the author of life, he will give eternal life to us too. Now, this is great stuff, but how do we wrap up a gospel presentation? We'll see what Paul does here in Acts 17. He tells them, he teaches them in verse 30 to repent. Now, as we talk with people about the gospel, they only have one of two responses. They can either believe it or reject it. And we need to call people to put their faith and trust in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of their sins. And so in verse 30, Paul calls these Athenians to repent. And repentance means to turn from the sin that displeases God. And and ultimately, repentance and faith are, are two sides of the same coin. It's one of the most fundamental evidences of true faith. We see when we repent, we are walking in light of what we truly believe. And if we do not repent, we do not really believe that Jesus is the Lord or that he is holy or that his grace and his spirit are sufficient to steer us to a path of holiness as well. And so repentance needs to be a fundamental component of our gospel presentations. All right, so that's just a quick overview of Paul's message on Mars Hill. Um, We could say so much more about this. Just finishing out Acts 17 here, we see at the end of this passage here, some people sneer at Paul's words, other people embrace it. And from there, Paul moves on to Corinth.
All right, so that is an all too short look at Acts 17. Just as a very quick review, Acts 17 shows us how the Bereans studied God's word and found that indeed it points to Christ as the Messiah King. It also shows us how Paul proclaimed the gospel to these Athenians. He taught them about God. He taught them about their condition before God. He taught them about Christ and he called them to repent. These are great principles for us to bring into any evangelistic conversation we might have as we carry the gospel into the world around us. And so there's much in all this to think about today as we go into our world, various places. Let us go with the gospel on our mind and our hearts, on our lips, and may we just be spreading the word of God to those around us. We'll leave things there. Thanks for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Until tomorrow, God bless.